If you look at the picture on the right of your screen, you can see that the prostate is sitting just below the bladder and in the male anatomy, it actually surrounds the prostate. And the best way to think about it sort of as an analogy is almost like a donut or an inner tube that surrounds the urethra. And we'll talk a little bit about what happens when that inner tube inflates or grows and blocks the outflow from the bladder. So as we age as men, our prostates enlarge. As we enter into adulthood, our prostates grow and then stabilize. And then as we age and get older, the prostates grow further still. There are a couple of conditions that affect the prostate. Prostatitis is inflammation or infection of the prostate. Prostate cancer, of course, is very different and it's a common cancer among men and typically is slow growing. And of course, the enlarged prostate is what we're talking about this evening. And as the name would suggest, it is enlargement of the prostate. Each of these conditions affects the prostate differently and they're not entirely related to each other or in any particular way. And we'll discuss that in a little bit. As we age, the older we get, the more likely it is that we will develop an enlarged prostate as men. Enlarged prostate affects more than 40 million men in the United States. So if you have symptoms of an enlarged prostate, rest assured you are not alone. This probably represents 30 to 40 percent of patients that urologists see on a yearly basis. By age 60, 70 percent of men have an enlarged prostate, and by the time you're age 80, 90 percent of men will have an enlarged prostate. So what is BPH, or benign prostatic hyperplasia? Well, as the name would suggest, it is non-cancerous, hence the first word benign. Prostatic hyperplasia or other places you'll see it as hypertrophy or sometimes just BPE, benign prostatic enlargement, are all terms that are basically designed to express the same thing. Non-cancerous growth of the prostate and usually specifically affecting urinary symptoms. Uh, note here that PSA, which is a prostate cancer screening tool, also rises with enlargement of the prostate as well as prostate cancer. And differentiating the two is often one of the first things we need to do when a patient comes in for a visit. So let's talk a little bit about normal versus enlarged prostates. So as the prostate enlarges, it can put pressure on the urethra or the tube that drains urine from the bladder and make it more difficult for the bladder to evacuate. And this, of course, can cause problems with urination. Interestingly enough, the overall size of the prostate doesn't always correlate with severity of symptoms. So if you think about the inner tube example surrounding the urethra at the base of the bladder, if you were to put more air in that inner tube, it can grow outward, but also inward. And really it's the inward growth as it compresses the urethra and makes the center of the tube smaller, that's when the prostate size tends to affect urinary function. So what happens when we don't do anything about an enlarged prostate, or more specifically, an enlarged and obstructing prostate? Well, the trouble is, is that the obstruction makes it harder for the bladder, which is a muscle, to compress and evacuate urine. Over time, this can cause enlargement or hypertrophy of the bladder muscle, and then eventually scarring and damage to that bladder muscle. In the most severe cases, it can make it so that the bladder muscle no longer can empty urine effectively or even at all, and catheters and other drainage methods are required for long-term management of evacuating urine, something that nobody looks forward to or wants to have happen. One of the goals of managing patients with enlarged prostates is trying to intervene earlier rather than when things are at their dire end and not much can be done to salvage bladder health. So when we're talking about enlarged prostate, what we're really talking about in the same breath is bladder health preservation. So let's talk a little bit about what happens when the prostate enlarges. Well, as you can see with the images on the screen in the schematic above and then the photographs below, as the normal prostate has a nice channel that you can actually see the bladder through, and I'll try and highlight this with the mouse here, that's looking through the tip of the prostate from here towards the bladder with a scope. And this nice open channel is an easy pathway for urine to flow through. So as the enlargement of the prostate begins with this benign overgrowth of tissue, this center of the inner tube starts to compress, and you can see it's not as easy for the urine to flow through a now narrower channel. And then finally, with significant overgrowth, the channel becomes pinched, and these sort of kissing lobes of the prostate, as we call them, make it very difficult for the bladder to evacuate. So what are some of the symptoms of an enlarged prostate? Well, these are pretty common, and uh, many people as they age, especially as men, will experience them over time. Frequent urination and multiple trips to the bathroom, a sudden urge to urinate, and even sometimes difficulty or painful uh, initiation of urination, weak or slow flow, 
and the incomplete emptying of the bladder or stopping and starting of flow are very common. Interestingly enough, these bottom three, the weak flow or incomplete emptying or stopping and starting, are often the first to occur because of enlargement of the prostate, just simply blocking the outflow. And then as changes to the bladder occur over time, we get more frequency and urgency of urination and some of the difficulties that arise because of changes in the bladder muscle itself. Most patients will simply stand at the urinal or at the toilet longer if their stream is weak or slower and they won't pay it much mind. But once frequency and especially urgency starts to disrupt people's lives, then that's when often they come in to see a urologist. It doesn't mean that's the only time you should see a urologist. We would love to see patients when they first start to notice the slowing of their stream because as I said earlier, intervening sooner is better than intervening later. What we were just talking about is when enlargement of the prostate affects quality of life, avoiding travel, interruption of leisure activities, using the bathroom stalls instead of urinals because it's difficult to initiate the stream or simply takes longer to empty, and of course, disruption of sleep. All these things, just from small and changes to the bladder and prostate's interaction, can have major impacts on people's quality of life. So how do we diagnose enlargement of the prostate? A good history and a discussion with your urologist about what symptoms you're experiencing are always a good start. Then, of course, an exam of the prostate and the abdomen and using basic tools like an ultrasound and a prostate exam and sometimes flow and bladder emptying testing can help better quantify what's happening between the bladder and the prostate itself. We have questionnaires that can help chart your course that have been validated to understand which symptoms are bothersome to you specifically and hopefully with treatments, which symptoms are improving and which are not over time. Some of the flow studies that we can measure involve assessing the strength of your stream, as well as the pressure that your bladder creates or needs to create to generate that flow. And by assessing those, as well as getting a sense of the size and shape of the prostate with ultrasound, and eventually looking at the prostate anatomy and bladder anatomy, we can get a pretty thorough understanding of the interaction and behavior of the bladder and prostate and the effects of the enlarged prostate on the bladder. The questionnaire that I was referring to is called the International Prostate Symptom Score. And it assesses your ability to empty the bladder, frequency, intermittency of urination, and so forth. And again, it helps us quantify and track the severity of symptoms and hopefully improvement of symptoms over time with treatment. And what are those treatment options? Well, this is really kind of a spectrum of less invasive on the left and more invasive on the right. And Eurolift, as you can see with the big gold circle in the middle, is kind of in between, in the middle of all those options. And we'll go over these in some detail, but they range between watchful waiting or observation, medication treatments, and of course the Eurolift procedure, and then more invasively thermotherapy and even surgery using laser or pottery. So starting on the least invasive side, watchful waiting or observation. We know that especially with the acute onset, meaning relatively short-term onset of symptoms, 30% of those will resolve just given time, and sometimes with dietary or behavioral changes. Obviously, the advantage to this, if things get better with basic changes to your diet or your behavior, well, then no treatments, no medications, no surgeries, no procedures are needed. And of course, there are no side effects to this. And it's the least expensive option because you simply have to change behavior or diet. The obvious disadvantage to this is that it's not so easy to change behavior and diet. As we all know, it may not work. As I said, 30% of patients will improve, but that leaves roughly 70% of patients that will not. And of course, there's a risk that the symptoms will simply worsen as we're watching and observing. So medications have been around for quite some time, decades at this point, and quite a few of them interact with the prostate to either help relax the muscle tissue in the prostate to allow the bladder to empty better or to shrink the prostate enlargement itself. Obviously, these, avoids, these medication options avoid procedures and surgeries and can provide symptom relief to some extent. Of course, the disadvantages are there can be side effects, both with short and long-term medication usage. And with these medications, they are taken daily from now on. So being on a medication for life is the only way to derive a benefit from that medication when it comes to managing an enlarged prostate. Herbal remedies, these generally uh, you will see advertised everywhere on TV and print ads, uh, wherever you go in, uh, in terms of health food stores. But the data behind them is actually quite poor. There isn't a lot of solid science to suggest that herbal remedies are really effective in managing urinary symptoms. So the Eurolift system, and we'll go into more detail on this later, is an either in-office or in-surgery center procedure, and it's outpatient. Um, it has the benefits of excuse me, preserving sexual function and generally rapid symptom relief and recovery within two to four weeks. 
Typically, patients go home without a catheter, and we have good data that suggests it provides long-term durable results. Of course, the disadvantages are that it is a procedure, and there can be some discomfort both during and afterwards, some blood in the urine and temporary increased urgency and frequency of urination, but generally these symptoms, as I said, resolve within two to four weeks. The heat and steam-based therapies like microwave therapy or resume are also considered to be minimally invasive treatment options for enlarged prostate, just like the Urolift procedure. They're also in-office or in-surgery center procedures, meaning outpatient or same day, and they tend to have fewer side effects than surgery and similar side effect profiles to Urolift. But the disadvantages with some of these heat or steam treatments is that they simply take longer to have their effect and the immediate recovery takes longer as well meaning catheters usually remain in for a few days, if not a week, and it takes weeks for symptom recovery as the heated or steam-treated prostate tissue has to regress to open up the channel. And of course, there's the traditional option of resecting or removing the prostate tissue. Now, this is considered a surgical option, but it is still minimally invasive in the sense that it's endoscopic with a scope into the urethra, and then the prostate tissue that's obstructing and blocking the channel is removed either with a energy like plasma or a laser to vaporize the tissue. Very few urologists these days use the old electrocautery, but that still works and is still very effective. Interestingly, the TERP or the transurethral resection of the prostate that we're talking about here is still considered to be the gold standard for managing an enlarged prostate, and it's against which everything else is benchmarked. But when we look at studies that for Urolift and these other minimally invasive procedures, we see that it approaches the effects and success rates of TERP. So that's why they have become quite popular amongst both patients and urologists because they're effective, but with a milder side effect profile. So the disadvantages of cutting tissue, as you might imagine, is an increased risk. So these are often either hospital or surgery center-based procedures. Sometimes they can require an overnight hospitalization, and it's a longer course of recovery, up to six weeks. And the side effect profile, as you can see on the lower right, is certainly more pronounced than you would have with a minimally invasive option like Urolift or Thermothera. So let's talk a little bit about Urolift specifically. The way that Urolift works is if you start on the left, this is the enlarged prostate, and you're looking at a straight head-on view with the bladder above and the prostate below, and urine is, when the bladder is compressed, flowing through the urethra here right in the center channel. So the first step is introducing a scope into the urethra and into the what we call prostatic urethra, and then applying suture clips through the prostate tissue that anchor themselves on the capsule of the prostate and provide support and tension on the urethral side of the prostate, opening the channel. So as I often will describe to my patients in the office, it's sort of like pulling curtains out of the way of a window and fastening with curtain fasteners to the side to leave an open channel. And we'll see that in a photo momentarily. This is an actual clip, and it's, as you can see, smaller than a dime, and it's made of nitinol, a permanent monofilament suture, and stainless steel, all of which we've been using in surgery and procedures over the last half century. So these are not um, foreign or abnormal materials. This is standard stuff that we've been using in procedures uh, for decades. So this is an animation of implanting the Urolift itself, and starting on the patient's right side, a clip is deployed through the prostate tissue, and the flange kicks out and secures itself to the capsule. And then the urethral end piece is attached, providing gentle tension on the prostate, holding the urethra open. And the same thing is done on the other side. And eventually, a narrow channel becomes more open. And this is a view looking down the channel of the urethra in this model of a narrow and then opened channel at the end. So this was, it looks like in an actual anatomical photo. Here on the left side, we have before treatment and an obstructive channel looking from the tip of the prostate in towards the bladder. And then afterwards, this is a nice open channel. You're looking into the bladder through this open bladder neck, quite a difference from left to right before and after. So what should patients expect after treatment with Urolift? Well, symptom improvement may start as soon as two weeks afterwards. Once the swelling from having the procedure done goes away, men start to notice an improvement, and it can continue up to three months. I actually tell patients that it can even go longer than that, especially if we're hoping for reversal of changes that have accrued in the bladder over time from having pushed against the large prostate over the years. Once we relieve that obstruction, we're hoping that those bladder changes will also reverse as well, but that can take time. 
The most common side effects that patients can experience with the urolift are mild to moderate, and they include pain, burning with urination, blood in the urine on occasion, and sometimes the urgent need to urinate or even the inability to control the urge. Thankfully, those are all ten temporary and tend to resolve within a few weeks after the procedure. And most of the symptoms have been characterized as mild to moderate and resolve relatively quickly. We have good data that suggests that over 90% of patients do not, do not need retreatment uh, at the five-year mark in studies that have been done. So this lasts a good long time, and it is repeatable. So if the prostate, as it does, continues to grow, then if obstruction recurs, we can repeat the urolift. Generally, this is covered by most insurance plans, including Medicare, and I think we'll turn it over for questions. Thank you, Dr. Radolinski. First question, what percentage of persons after the Eurolift are completed are able to completely stop taking medication? So in terms of the statistics, I don't have them at the tip of my fingers, but I would say the one of the stated goals that we have for doing the procedures to get patients off medication. So I would say the vast majority. And if you think about what medications are trying to do, they're pharmacologically trying to relax and open the channel by a few millimeters. And as you saw in that video with the Urolift, we're moving tissue by a centimeter or more. No pun intended, the Urolift does a lot more heavy lifting than medication ever could. Do you need general anesthesia to have a Urolift done? And can I resume work from home after a few days? So generally, general anesthesia is not required. For some patients, we offer intravenous sedation. Some patients tolerate this well under a local anesthetic. And what's relatively new to our practice is we're now offering local anesthetic with the addition of nitrous oxide or laughing gas just to make the experience more pleasant. And yes, you can resume work from home as soon as you're comfortable to do so. So I often will do procedures on a Friday and by Monday patients are back at work either at the office or working from home. Can you please go back to the insurance slide? What is the main long-term complaint you have received after a year lift? I suppose I can't think of a long-term complaint, although I, there is a reported potential side effect in one to two in a hundred cases of a clip being displaced and falling back into the bladder. And because it's exposed to the electrolytes in the urine, it can calcify and form a stone. It's not exactly the question that was asked, but a potential long-term side effect is potentially the development of a stone in a calcified clip. Thankfully, that's a straightforward solution. We can go in and remove the stone in the clip if it becomes displaced. What about incontinence? So there have not been, to my knowledge, any reported instances of incontinence in the long term after the urolift. And the reason for that is that the procedure itself really does not interact with the urinary sphincters. It's unblocking the blocked prostatic urethra by moving the enlarged prostate tissue out of the way. But because we're not cutting or heat treating or vaporizing any tissue, the sphincters are left alone and it's the urinary sphincters that can control urinary content. What percentage of recipients have had to repeat the procedure after five years? After five years, so roughly about 10%. In other words, 90% of patients don't need a retreatment at the five-year mark, according to the studies that were done. This gentleman has had a TERP operation two years ago and wants to know if this would impact his ability to have a Eurolift. It can. So it really depends on how much regrowth or persistent obstruction there is after a TERP. So generally after a TERP, and especially one that was done just a few years ago, we would hope that the channel is still open because tissue has been resected. But in some cases, either the resection was not complete or tissue has grown back. And if there's evidence of tissue that's blocking the channel that can be moved with the Eurolift, then potentially you'd be a candidate for the Eurolift procedure. I've done uh, occasional Eurolifts in patients that have had TERPs uh, years in the past, and because prostate tissue continues to grow, it can grow back in and reobstruct. And instead of doing a repeat TERP, we've had success doing a Eurolift as an alternative option. Is there a maximum size of prostate um, in order to receive a Eurolift procedure? Generally, the FDA has approved the Eurolift procedure for 100 gram prostates and smaller. There's no lower limit, but the upper limit is about 100 grams. That's why ultrasound imaging and measuring the prostate is so important. Um, many insurance companies set the limit at 80 grams, so it, it is a little bit dependent on insurance coverage, unfortunately. Interestingly enough, when the original studies were done, because they weren't limited by size restrictions, they were doing prostate sizes up to, I believe, 110 or 120 grams. 
um, with success. But right now, our limit is 100 grams based on FDA. Are there any medications that um, a patient would need to take before a Urolift procedure? Before? No. Although some insurance companies, in order to approve the Urolift, will ask that patients have at least tried the standard medications to see how they tolerate them or if they're successful. When can a man return to sexual relations after the Urolift is completed? Once the discomfort from the procedure has gone away, so usually within a week or two at the outside. Can Urolift cause incontinence and can it damage the urethra? So incontinence, no, there haven't been reported cases. Uh, can it ever? I suppose anything's possible, but we haven't seen that occur because, as I said before, the urinary sphincters are not really involved or, uh, or bothered by the procedure itself. Can it damage the urethra? There has been some small percentage of patients where strictures have been reported, which are basically scar tissues uh, as a response to having the urolift, but I believe that's 1% or fewer of cases that have uh, issues with scar tissue or stricture. Does having a urolift impact future biopsies, MRIs, or ultrasound procedures? The short answer is not really. Certainly biopsies and ultrasounds are not affected by it. And the Eurolift, as it stands currently, is MRI compatible, meaning that up to the technology that we have in our current MRI scanners, the Eurolift is safe. And most radiologists know how to work around or exclude the Eurolift clips as they're trying to read specifically a prostate MRI. But if it's for something else in the pelvis or abdomen, then it's absolutely safe and isn't bothered at all. How often do men who have Eurolift need to wear a catheter? I would say one in 10 patients, at least in my own experience, would go home with a catheter. And I always tell patients prior to the procedure that we'd love to send you home without a catheter, but the primary goal is to keep you safe and comfortable. So if leaving a catheter at least overnight will do that, then that's obviously the priority. I'd say about one in 10. Typically, how long before a patient can resume strenuous exercise like cycling after a Eurolift? About a week or two at the outside. When was Eurolift approved and how many Eurolift procedures have you performed? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't remember when Eurolift was originally approved. I think it was almost 10 years ago, but don't quote me on that for sure. I think at this point I've done over 200 procedures myself. Um, cause retrograde ejaculation? The answer is no. There have not been any reported cases of ejaculatory or sexual dysfunction after the Eurolift procedure because when we're not cutting or vaporizing tissue, those structures are preserved. What procedures are typically used to assess the size of the prostate prior to deciding which BPH procedure is best? Ultrasound is most commonly done, although patients that have had previous imaging like an MRI, uh, that can be useful as well. Um, some urologists prefer a transrectal ultrasound. In my practice, I tend to use just a transabdominal ultrasound to get a sense of the size and shape of the prostate. And that's part of the diagnostic that we work on with each patient that comes in with urinary symptoms to get a better understanding of the interaction between the bladder. Could you say again how long the Eurolift procedure takes? It's about 15 minutes. And we're having several questions again about approximately how long after a Eurolift procedure men can stop taking their medications for BPA. So this is pretty variable and it often depends on the comfort level of the urologist. In my personal experience, I'll ask patients to continue whatever medications they've been on for about a week after the procedure and then to discontinue it so that uh, by that point we can start to see how they do um, without medications since the initial recovery period is coming to an end. Uh, But this is very urologist dependent, I would say. So you'll likely get instructions on that from your individual urologist as part of the post-operative plan. Since the prostate tissue may continue to grow after the Eurolift procedure, will there be discomfort over time? Not a result, as a result of the prostate tissue growing. It will simply grow around the clips, but this doesn't cause pain as it's a very slow and gradual process. So generally the answer is no, that growth even with the Eurolift in place is not painful. How does the Eurolift procedure compare to a biopsy? Not quite sure what the question is asking, but I'll try and answer the best I can. Um, A biopsy is generally done transrectally with an ultrasound, and the goal of a biopsy is to identify prostate cancer. The Eurolift is done with a scope passed through the urethra, and of course it's to help manage enlarged prostate symptoms. If the question is, how do they compare in terms of discomfort, it's hard to tell because everybody's uh, experience of discomfort and pain is very individual. Um, They're similar in duration. They both take about 15 minutes to do, but I think that's probably the best answer I can give. 
Would someone who's been treated for prostate cancer still be a candidate for a urolith? It depends on the treatment. If you've had your prostate removed surgically for prostate cancer, then the answer is no. There's no prostate to treat. If you've had radiation, either brachytherapy with seed implants or external beam radiation, and then the answer is possibly yes. Depending on what the anatomy of the prostate looks like and how much obstruction is found during the diagnostic portion of the evaluation, then you can be treated with uh, Urolift after radiation therapy. Interestingly enough, I've treated a, a good number of patients prior to starting radiation therapy who have had an enlarged prostate with urinary symptoms, and putting the clips in not only helped alleviate longstanding urinary symptoms, but they also serve as fiducial markers, meaning targets for the radiation oncologist to treat the cancer. But the short answer is yes, you can if you still have a prostate, even after prostate cancer treatment with radiation, have the Urolift. Are there any sexual side effects after the Urolift procedure? Generally, no. It's the only minimally invasive procedure that has a uh, no reported sexual side effect profile. Is there any beneficial effect on urine leakage with Urolift? It's a relatively complicated question. So if the urinary leakage is because of overactivity of the bladder as a consequence of an enlarged prostate, meaning that picture of the bladder that we saw, that the prostate has caused enlargement and irritation of the bladder muscle, the picture on the right, then relieving the obstruction by whatever means, Urolift medication or surgery, certainly will stop the progression of that, or hopefully stop the progression of that damage, and hopefully begin to reverse the changes. However, I will say that patients that have bladder damage to the point where they're having incontinence when they have the urge to urinate, they can't hold it. Sometimes additional therapies specifically for the bladder, usually in the form of medications or other treatments will be required. But as I usually tell patients in the office, until you relieve the obstruction, you really can't make any progress on the health and function of the bladder. This is the last question. Um, this person is asking, how do you decide how long a catheter needs to stay in after the procedure? In the rare cases that I leave a catheter, it's usually just overnight. Uh, in some circumstances, if uh, there was a need to leave the catheter for longer, I think the longest I've had a catheter uh, left in a patient was for two days. Um, but like a lot of things in medicine, it's, it's a judgment call uh, on the part of the surgeon. One last question. If you can explain any changes in satisfaction that some of your patients who received Urolift have reported back to you. Well, improvement or resolution of those urinary symptoms that we saw in the slides, urgency and frequency of urination improving, nighttime urination improving, um, probably most immediately better flow and better emptying and less difficulty in starting the stream because we've hopefully relieved the blockage from enlarged prostate with the Eurolift procedure. Thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar. Dr. Radulinski is seeing patients in person at our Bethesda office and via telehealth appointments. For more information or to make an appointment, please visit us at Chesapeake Urology where you can now schedule your own appointment online. Thank you so much, Dr. Radulinski. Have a good You're evening. You're very welcome. Thank you everyone for joining.